in the construction of it, this enormous stretch of derelict land was left, and the local community got together to use this land. Well, they don't like the idea of non-professionals writing these things. Yes. <laughs> um, they think it's very strange. In the interests of property developers and not our community, they're not knocking our homes down for our benefit, they're knocking them down for their benefit, the one percenters. It would change, but it would still remain a working class area in a large part, you know, but that, that's what's changing now. So it, instead of it just sort of handing on and maybe the housing improving, it's, it's not improving. It, it's, it's been handed over to a completely different type, you know, the elite. The road Freestonia, where the community came together and demanded um, housing rights for themselves. So squatting at that time wasn't unusual. All of London was full of squats. I mean, you know, you, you just, it, you, anyway, I won't go into the details, but <laughs> you can squat anywhere, basically. And now you can't, so they've changed the law. The only place you can squat now is in commercial property. So as I was saying, the law has changed in favor of property owners, whereas in the old days, you know, you, it, it was in the favour of the people, basically, you know. Empty properties not being used. Like, a lot of the area around here was bombed in the war, so, you, you know, kids grew up on, on, on wrecks, you know, like on, on old bombs, you know, they were just where you used to go and play. And then the houses were really run down, and a lot of them empty, and that's how the squatting came about. Mm. But we'll, we'll have a look at Freston Road, and then maybe talk a little bit more about how people got organised. Yeah. is virtually all new build, yeah? yeah? Only very, very few properties that have survived from the original time. The People's Hall being one of them. Uh, there's a pub, the Bramley Arms, on the corner up there. There's yeah. a few houses up there. But that's basically all that has survived. But um, basically what happened very quickly is that when, when Freestonia formed, it was basically, uh, like, for want of a better word, hippies, squatters, musicians, artists, drug addicts, it was like a real mixture of people. But they didn't just, when, when the council came to get rid of them, they didn't just leave. They formed and became active, and they demanded that the council, if they were going to knock down what they were going to knock down, that the council rehouse them. What they did was that they all changed their surnames to Bramley, because that's one of the roads there, is Bramley Road, and the council has a duty to rehouse them if they were As part of the same family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they formed the Bramley Housing Co-op. That's right, which, which built these houses. Everything that you can see was built as a result of that here. In from not always been a shift in communities here, you know, despite people with very long histories of living here. Yeah. You know, we've always been fighting this sort of change, which at the moment is particularly virulent. You know? It's basically like, only can be described as like a scorched earth policy. Yeah. It's like total annihilation of our community. Rebuilding it, rebuilding it in the interests of property developers and not our community. They're not knocking our homes down for our benefit, they're knocking them down for their benefit, the one percenters. Bramley House, all these tower blocks, all this beautiful um, green space there is earmarked for demolition and for social cleansing, yeah? yeah. And um, that, this is what we call on this side the Silchester Estate, and where we are is um, Lancaster West Estate. Coming together, the Radical Housing Network bringing these groups together, and, you know, Cressingham Gardens finding legal ways to challenge the government, you know, to make case law so that now when they plan a redevelopment, they can't just plan it, they have to look at refurbishment. You see, that's mm. what Crescent Gardens have achieved so far. Then you have the Aylesbury estate where there's human right legislation being uh, applied because there were certain older residents on the estate 
whose rights were, their human rights were looked to be abused by being forcibly moved out of their community. So, you know, that's been challenged now by the local authority. But if they lose, if the local authority lose that challenge and it becomes case law, then it's, it's all stuff that can hopefully protect communities going forward. Whether it will be in time for Silchester, mm. whether it will be in time for, you know, these plans, who knows. But maybe by the time they get to Lancaster West, there will be this uh, legislation in place, you know. So this area is um, low-rise housing built around 1900, 1910. You'll see in a moment. Red brick, two-storey houses laid out at that time. Um, this is Latimer Road, as I say, which is an employment zone and the council's planning policies only allow office use. Only office. No creche, no school, no gym just pure office use. So every time there's a recession, offices fall vacant, um, there's nowhere to eat in the street, there are no cafes, there's one pub which is shut most of the time, and that's it. Um, so about three years ago we said to the council we want to do a neighbourhood plan for this area. Um, and this is the plan that we produce. And it's taken about two years with a lot of arguments with the planners at the local authority. They don't like the idea of non-professionals writing these things. Um, they think it's very strange and I'd be interested whether, again in your countries, whether this can now happen. I mean we're, we're a group of residents. <clears throat> I did originally train as a sort of architect planner many years ago but never worked as one. Uh, I have worked in local government so I know how that functions which helps. Um, so you, you, you form a committee and you put together a plan um, and it has to meet certain requirements in law but you can do some changes to the council's policies. Uh, and then it goes to a local referendum, you have a vote and everybody on the electoral register votes. So this happened in February and we had a 23% turnout which isn't bad, not much worse than a local election. 92% uh, in favour, 18% against, and that means the council has to adopt the neighbourhood plan. Doesn't have a choice in that state. And then this becomes part of the development plan for the borough, and planning applications get decided on the basis of the policies in this. So one of the reasons we wanted to do it is to change the policies for this street, because we reckon it makes more sense to have mixed use in this street. And as we walk up, you'll see it's got light industrial, got houses on the other side. It's only four little bits of the street that are zoned. It's just that bit, this bit here, and so forth. We said we'd like it to go back to a mixed use street, have housing as well as uh, offices. The idea for this enormous ringway had been conceived that would be a motorway that would go around central London to relieve congestion. Because they instantly came across the realities that one, it was far too expensive, and two, uh, the reality of sticking a six lane motorway in the middle of an urban area with residents in high density areas. Um, so even though they managed to get this stretch made, uh, basically the whole concept just fell through. And you may have seen some of the kind of the screws of this coming off down, further down, where they just kind of go into nothing, they go into nowhere. Those were all supposed to connect to another ringway that was going further out. So there were going to be two ringways all the way around the middle. Um, so in the construction of it, this enormous stretch of derelict land is there. And the local community got together to use this land. Uh, it's, a very, it's always been a very young population around here. Um, always a, a lot of people who are economically disadvantaged, um, but at the same time very kind of creative, strong creativity, strong kind of uh, heritage and culture. And so very quickly these groups got together and decided to use the land to create play space for young people. 
So that began a series of different adventure playgrounds along the, along the area and they soon got wind of a desire to turn all of the space underneath um, the newly built Westway into a car park for buses and basically just uninspiring uses of this land. And they realised, well, if we can get hold of it for the community, then maybe we could do something a little bit more, you know, a little bit more true to us and more interesting. So the Highways Agency, who owned, who owned the land back then, gave the land to the local council, who then gifted it to this new group, which was named the North Kensington Community Trust. But what was discovered quite quickly was that this charitable structure was kind of a way of the council just controlling it at arm's length. And it wasn't actually in the community's hands. Uh, it was by name, but in practice it really wasn't. And so that began a long, you know, now 45 year struggle for the community to genuinely take control of the land and have it used genuinely for the purposes it was intended to be used for. Um, one of the first things to be built was Maxilla Children's Centre, which you may have passed. Um, that was one of the most uh, symbolic buildings, Maxilla, because it really genuinely was made by the community. And in its creation, the community actually um, empowered itself through the creation of a kind of a new form of children's centre. And so it really was breaking new ground. My dream, I mean, for this, in relation to this space, I'm thinking specifically about the 23 acres, because it's already famous worldwide for Portobello Market, for punk, reggae, you know, Rastafarianism, carnival. I want it to be world famous for genuine social innovation and protest and challenge. That's what for me it would be. It would be a space where people come to from all over the world. That was what it was born to be from the people. It started with adventure playgrounds. It started with a guy called Adam Ritchie going out there and literally planting hammers and nails for children to find and make things and build things. It started with risk. That was a risk. What happens if a kid picks the hammer up and smashes his hand? Well, yeah, those things happen. But it's just, this is where it started with. And this is what, for me, that's my dream. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a space where I can walk, any day I can walk in and say, I want to do something, what can I do? You know, oh, look, there's a bit of space, can I just paint that? Or, you know, and there's a way of finding out how I can do that. There's a library that tells me how you can do things like that. You know, lawyers and solicitors from around the world coming here to go to libraries that, that show them how people have changed things all around the world. You know, that for me is my kind of dream of this space.